Um, welcome, everybody, to the e-extension webinar on imported fire ants. Uh, I think the overall goal of this presentation today is to give you more information about recognizing fire ants and their biology and management. Um, Dr. Flanders has asked me to, to provide information today on recognizing fire ants, so that's going to be the primary purpose of my presentation. Um, if you attended the webinar last year, actually, my talk will be a little bit similar to that, so this may be a refresher for you if you attended it, but hopefully all the information I'll present today will be useful and will provide you with a better handle on how to recognize fire ants. Uh, before I go any further, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Nadir Youssef and Joshua Basham, who are also both at Tennessee State University with me. Uh, they provided a lot of the, the images I'll be showing. Uh, start off with uh, imported fire ants are not the only fire ants in the United States. There's actually a, a lot of different uh, fire ant species in the United States presently. Most people are familiar with the imported species, um, red imported and the black imported. Uh, these species in particular are the ones that cause most of the nuisance problems that we now have to deal with as far as management. Uh, as the name implies, imported, they were introduced into the United States around 1900, it's believed through the port of Mobile. Uh, their country of origin was South America. Um, now they have pretty much spread over most of the southern United States. There are actually two species of imported fire ants presently in the country, uh, the red imported, Solanopsis invicta, and the black imported, Solanopsis ricteri. Um, as the names imply, the, the red imported fire ant is a little more reddish in coloration, and as you expect, the black imported are, are darker. Um, both of these species can uh, cross uh, and produce a reproductively functional hybrid fire ant, uh, and this one is very, very difficult to distinguish uh, between the black or the red imported. Uh, basically, it has a little bit of an intermix of coloration between the two groupings. Um, the red imported primarily occurs in the southern United States uh, and also is out in the western United States now and in California. Uh, the hybrid and the black imported are mostly found in the northern parts of Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama, and also throughout Tennessee. Um, there's four other important fire ant species that do uh, you might possibly encounter. Um, the tropical fire ant uh, is found in the southern United States. It's also believed to be an imported species. Uh, the southern fire ant is found in the southern and western United States. And then there's two other species that are common in the southwestern United States. Um, most of these are not as problematic as uh, the imported species. Uh, uh, they do sting, and it's possible you could encounter them. But uh, if you're finding large numbers of mounds on your property, then more than likely it's going to be one of the imported species. There's actually about uh, 14 other species in the same genus Solenopsis in the United States, uh, but again, uh, these are much less economically important than the imported species. The map here uh, on this next slide shows the current distribution of imported fire ants in the United States. Uh, the red counties are basically counties that are completely quarantined or infested with fire ants. Uh, yellow counties presently uh, have partial infestations, and the same thing with the hatched areas. Or these are just isolated infestations, but pretty much uh, fire ants are occupying most of the southern United States now. If we look at uh, the possible range expansion of fire ants, uh, the blue colored areas show where we think fire ants could potentially uh, advance their range if moisture is adequate, and that's going to be particularly important in the southwestern United States where without irrigation it's unlikely the fire ants could expand into some of these regions. Um, all of these range prediction models are based on the red imported fire ant. Um, there presently aren't any models for black imported or hybrid fire ants, so it's quite possible uh, the hybrid and the black imported appear to be a little bit more cold tolerant. and the actual final range of fire ants could be uh, farther north than what's indicated on this map. And it's just kind of a side note uh, where I'm occurring at in Tennessee, uh, we do have hybrid imported fire ants 
presently on the Cumberland Plateau at greater than 2,000 feet elevation, so they can occupy uh, higher elevations for sure. Uh, this next image shows a, a, a lateral view of an imported fire ant and just a couple of things I wanted to point out on this. Uh, fire ants, all the species have these two nodes. Um, I'll draw. They're, the first one's called uh, the petiole and the second one's called the post petiole. Um, these nodes occur between the, the, the hind portion of the abdomen can put an arrow on that. And also, uh, the, actually on, on fire ants and bees and wasps, the, the thorax and the first abdominal segment have been fused into what's called a propodium. So really these, these, these two nodes are actually between the first abdominal segment and then the, the hind abdominal segment. But uh, this characteristic is not unique to fire ants only. Um, it can also be found in other ant species, but uh, if you find a, an ant that has a single node, then more than likely you're not dealing with imported fire ants. Uh, fire ants also have a sting on the tip of the abdomen. And again, this is a general characteristic. This is not unique to fire ants only. There are other species of ants that can sting. But uh, This next slide here shows a close-up of a fire ant sting in the upper left corner. And uh, the sting has actually been pulled out a little bit, just so you can see what the entire sting looks like. Um, it's not usually this long. Um, the sting functions very similar to a hypodermic needle to inject venom. And that venom is used to secure prey, but it's, it's also used in defense of the colony. Only uh, female worker ants can sting, and that's because the sting is actually a modified ovipositor. And the ovipositor is the structure that insects use, female insects use to lay eggs. Um, in the case of fire ants, the worker casts are all fe sterile females unable to lay eggs. The queen also has an ovipositor, but she is unable to actually sting with it. It's, it's designed only for laying eggs. Um, fire ants also have distinct compound eyes, as seen in the lower left image. Again, this characteristic is not distinct or unique to fire ants. There are other ant species with distinct compound eyes. However, fire ants, uh, if, you're, if you encounter an ant species that is lacking eyes or has the eyes greatly reduced, then more than likely it's not a fire ant. Um, fire ants also have, uh, the imported species have a median clapial tooth right here on the, on the face. And that will distinguish uh, the imported species from Geminata, the tropical species, and Xyloni, the southern species. Fire ants have a 10-segmented antenna with the last two segments expanded into a club. And then a final characteristic that uh, is not, again, unique to fire ants, but um, it's commonly seen in a lot of fire ant colonies. Uh, we have dimorphism of worker size, where you'll have some ants workers that are really large and some that are really tiny. And even this characteristic can be somewhat variable because some types of fire ant colonies, such as the multiple queen colonies, which um, uh, some, col some fire ant colonies will have more than one queen in them. A lot of those colonies will have uniform, uniformly small worker sizes. But uh, um, I have, most of the colonies I've encountered seem to have this dimorphism characteristic. So again, if you look at all of these different characteristics and put them together, and also if you're finding large numbers of fire ant mounds on your property, then more than likely you're dealing with the imported species of fire ants. And that kind of brings me to my next characteristic. Uh, fire ants, is, as well known, have a very aggressive um, nature. They, they will readily swarm up onto any object that, that encounters their mound once it's disturbed could be your leg or uh, grass blades surrounding the, the mound, just any structure that's in contact with it when it's disturbed. Uh, when fire ants actually attack, the, these female sterile workers will bite with their mandibles on one end and then sting with the, the abdomen. They actually, because of these two, these two nodes between the 
thorax and the abdomen, that gives them greater flexibility. They, they don't even have to release their bite. They can continue to sting and move their abdomen and sting at multiple points while still maintaining a grip with their mouth parts. We look at some of the reactions to fire ant stings. Uh, this can be quite variable. Um, I've noticed with some of the hybrid and black imported fire ant stings that I've received, uh, I usually don't get this significant of a reaction, but uh, it's very common with the red imported fire ants to get a white pustule that will form about 24 hours after a sting. And uh, very similar to uh, smallpox in appearance. And it may take a couple of days for this to go away. But uh, commonly, you also encounter just a red welt that may just disappear with time, a little bit of an irritation. If we look at the, the fire ant mound itself, um, the surface of the mound typically has loose, pelleted-like soil all over the, the surface, kind of gives it a fluffy appearance. Um, this can be variable. It depends on uh, frequency of rain. The workers can remake this this fluffy appearance fairly quickly after a rain event. Uh, another distinction on fire ant mounds is you will not find any external exit holes on the surface of the mound per se. Uh, the ants primarily exit from lateral foraging tunnels. The exception to this is during mating flights, the workers will open up the mound to let the winged reproductives escape from the colony itself. However, in most cases, if you encounter uh, ant mounds that have a single entrance, such as these pictures here on this slide, uh, and workers going in and out of that, uh, it's more than likely not going to be fire ants. Uh, mound shape can be uh, highly variable, and uh, it's influenced by a lot of different factors. Uh, definitely varies seasonally with weather patterns. Um, Mounds will be very large a lot of times in the warmer, damper periods of the year, but if you get into extended hot or dry weather, mounds can be very inapparent. Um, mounds may range from pyramidal in shape to very oblong to almost completely flat, and a lot of this also has to do with disturbance, um, rainfall, soil type, uh, obstacles that the ants encounter while they're trying to build the mound structure. It's uh, very common to find the surface of the mound without a lot of vegetation on it. The ants seem to do a good job of removing vegetation and preventing it from growing on the actual surface of the mound. In certain soil types, like clay soils that stick together better, uh, mounds can be really large, up to two feet in height. Um, in sandier soils that don't hold together as well, the mounds may be completely flat. If mounds are frequently disturbed, they usually will be flat, uh, disturbed by lawnmowers or vehicle traffic. And colonies often are found in sites where there's less disturbance. The, the, the mound colony will move the mound to a location where they don't receive disturbance from lawnmowers, such as next to fence rails or, or posts or trees, or even next to buildings where colonies probably also receiving some benefit in terms of temperature regulation. And that, that is probably the apparent reason for the mound structure itself. It does allow the colony to somewhat regulate uh, temperatures. If we look at the internal structure of a fire ant mound, it basically has a honeycombed appearance throughout the, both the portion of the mound that's above the soil line as well as down below the soil line. And the workers will move the queen and the, the larvae and eggs up and down in this honeycomb network find optimal temperatures for their survival. A uh, final characteristic that's commonly seen with fire ants uh, are these foraging trails that may extend long distances from the mound itself. Uh, they're very apparent wherever the, the trail crosses a dirt road or across uh, recently tilled fields. And one distinction of these foraging tunnels, you will see uh, portions that are subterranean and portions that are exposed to above ground. And the purpose of this, more than likely, is to allow the workers exit points to search for food, but at the same time, they, they benefit from having subterranean portions that protect them from natural 
which uh, one of our speakers is coming up. We'll talk about that. And I think that brings us to our next speaker, which Kathy will probably introduce. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, 